Hey everyone, Kevin from MechanicalAdvantage.com. In the last few months, I've been contacted by a handful of customers looking for some help with some different aspects of programming the Zometry mill test part. If you don't know who or what Zometry is, it's a company that connects people who need components to be manufactured with a network of certified vendors that bid on jobs to complete those components. In order to be a Zometry vendor, you have to submit a test part for the segment of the industry you want to get work for. Now that we have programs like Fusion 360 that are affordable and capable, of programming CNC machines that are also affordable and capable like the SILE milling machines. There are more and more users looking to get certified to find work by being a Zometry partner. This video isn't an endorsement or recommendation for using Zometry. In fact, I know very little about the process or economics of bidding work through Zometry. I've seen other YouTube channels that use competing CAD CAM products to do tutorials on how to program this Zometry mill test part. So I thought I'd create the same sort of video series, but for Fusion 360 users. If you ever find that you need help with one of the projects that you're working on, I'll put a link to my website where you can go out and schedule time or even set up a consultation with me to find out if we're a good fit on the project that you want to work on. I'm on the Zometry website and I'm at the place where you can go for the information about the test mill file and you can see some different things here. The important link that I'll put in the description below is this is where you would go to download the packet that contains some of the files you need to work on this part. And I've already downloaded this. So let me just go ahead and switch and take a look at what you get when you download the file. It's a zip file and inside the zip file are four files. If we look at this first one, it's just a 2D print showing um, different dimensions and tolerances. You can see things are pretty wide open at plus or minus 5 thou. And there's a couple dimensions. Uh, have a look at all the dimensions on the print, of course. But you can see some dimensions are a little bit tighter, such as here or here. You know, I'd look at the next thing. There's a step file that you can work from. So that step file can be opened up in pretty much every 3D modeling package, including Fusion. And then there's another drawing file, but this one has balloons next to it, indicating the dimensions that they want recorded when you do make the part file. And we'll look at the last document here. This just contains guidelines and instructions. So there's just different things that come in the box and what you need to do. And then the last sheet has an inspection report that after you manufacture the part, you're supposed to record the values that you get to be included with the part that you send back. So let's talk about the step file a little bit. As you know, we can open these files inside of programs like Fusion 360, but what you may not know is that you can also open these sorts of files in any text editor, like on the Mac using text edit or on Windows using Notepad. I've got this opened up in a text editor on the Mac here, and you can look at some of the information called the header info. If we look at the top of the header, you can see that the step file was created using uh, some tool called steptools.com. If we kind of go down a little bit farther, we'll see the location where this file originally resided on the user's computer. And another thing you might want to go look at, um, well, it does say that this file was made from some Autodesk product. I don't know which one it might have been, but it does say it uses the Autodesk translation framework. Work. And the file schema is automotive, which is step 214. So that's all the stuff that I sort of look at. I like to look at these header files, find out maybe who made it, what CAD program authored it. Over the years, I've learned that some CAD programs seem to author step files better than others. So I just kind of kind of look at this header information to find out what it is that I'm um, dealing with. You also find some different nuggets of information inside of these step files. So you can see here the location that this was originally on the user's computer. It looks like it was on an individual named Drew Hildebrand. I just spent a second and I went out to LinkedIn and I did a search for his name and I can see that he has Zometry experience. So it looks like the information in that header is correct. So now that we've kind of run through that, let's jump into Fusion. And what I'm gonna do is open up this file and get things set up so that we can start programming it. And we'll program the first side of the part before I make a second video that shows flipping the part over and milling the opposite side. The first step of the programming process is to open up the step file. Now, lots of people I see go to the data panel and they hit the upload button and they upload the file uh, that way and they have to wait just a little bit for the file to translate so that they can open it back up. My preferred method for doing this is to go to the file menu and choosing open. I can then browse to my computer choose that step file and I can open it directly that way without having to first upload it to the cloud. So that can save you a lot of time if you're dealing with step files or IGES files a lot of the time. This also works with opening up native Fusion files. 
You may notice that there's something missing on the screen right now. And if you look at the very bottom of the screen, you won't see any history. So when you open up files from other CAD packages or neutral files like this, they open up in history free mode. So any sketches or features I create won't be tracked. So one of my favorite things to do to start out with is to right click on the design name and choose capture design history. Now I can see that I have a timeline. I can see how this file was created, but any of the sketches or features I do from now on will be tracked as if they were natively drawn inside of Fusion. The other thing that you might note is that the file isn't maybe in the right orientation for what we wanted to do for machining. And I'm not gonna worry about that. Fusion's really flexible about how you set up your file in the manufacturing environment. And so I'm just gonna leave everything oriented the way it, way it is. And if you look at the view cube up there, the Z is pointing up, the X is going to the right. You can see the front, top, and right planes. And when I get to the manufacturing environment, I'm just going to change the names or orientation of the, of the view cube it's gonna leave the X, Y, and Z exactly as it was, but it's gonna rechange the lighting and rename all the sides of the view cube to match the orientation that I wanna program in. Before I go too much farther, I'm gonna to wanna to make sure that I save this file. So I'll choose the save icon. I'm just gonna leave it as the default name and that's the directory I want it to go to and I'll choose save. So now I know my file is safe. I also have a second tab open that I don't need to have open. So I'm just gonna click on the X, it's just a blank file. And now I only have the part that I'm working on open. When I see people program this file, oftentimes they start with this orientation. So this is the Z up first side and they do all a bunch of work on here and then they flip it over and do the back side. I'm gonna start this file with this being the top side. So I'm just gonna mill around the outside of the, of the part, face it off. That's all I'm gonna do on the first operation. And the reason for that is if I start from this orientation and I mill all this stuff away, including these angled faces, when I go to flip it, I don't have great services to rest the part on so that I can Z off of some known surface. I have to figure out how to probably set this part up or hold it on something or other. So for me, I'm going to start in this orientation, which I think is just going to be a lot easier to do. I wouldn't consider this a very difficult part. And typically I probably wouldn't even bring in a vice to use to program this. I am and going to use a vice in this case. And the main reason for that is the piece of material that Zometry gives you to machine this is three inches in the X, two inches in the Y and one inch in the Z. And you have not a lot of material to hang on to with this with the thickness of material that they give you. A little tool you may or may not know about is from the select menu, I'm gonna choose selection tools and I'm gonna choose select by boundary and I'm gonna click on the part. Now that'll give me the total bounding box of this part. So I can see that three inch is gonna work nice. The uh, two inch is gonna be pretty good for the Y, but the one inch here is only gonna leave me about 127 thousandths, 0.127 of material to hang on to. I'm gonna want to scooch this down in the stock a little bit so I can face 10 to 15 thousandths of an inch off so I can get a nice flat surface on the bottom. We'll be under an eighth of an inch of material to hang on to when this is all said and done. Having the vise in a file like that is helpful to know if you're going to hit the jaws or not. You certainly don't need to, you can do math for this as well. It's just visually easier to do if you do bring in a vise. I'm gonna go grab the vise that I wanna use for this file. So I'll go to my data panel and I'm gonna click on the home icon and I will find the mlock directory. I'm gonna grab the 125 slim I want the Imperial version of this. And then I'm going to use the Gripper Jaws stock. And I'm just gonna say insert into my current design. I've got a video coming out that's gonna talk about Fusion Team, but one of the things you need to know is that you can't insert parts from other projects unless you're using Fusion Team. So that may be one of the things you want to do to get started with that. I've got the parts sitting in the orientation that I wanna start up machining it. And so I'm gonna orient my vise sort of to match that. It's not critical that you do this. It's just, I find it easier to get everything to match. So I'm just gonna rotate this. And so it says 90 degrees. And then I'm just gonna kind of drag it out of the way and I'll hit okay. I'm gonna right click on my vice assembly and say I wanna break the link. And once the link is broken, I'm gonna to go to the modify change parameters and I'm gonna look at the stock that I have here. And we said the stock is going to be three by two by one. And now I can choose okay and the stock is updated. And then I'm gonna add a joint between the stock and the part. So from the assemble menu, I'm gonna choose the joint and I wanna choose the top center face right there. 
and I want to joint that to the top center face of the part that I'm working on. It's only going to preview the stock, but that's okay. And now I'm just going to flip it and drag it up. The reason I kind of exaggerate the drag is because it makes it easy to see what field they need to go change here. And I think I'm going to do 15 thousandths of an offset to give it some material to clean off. When I hit OK, everything is going to snap into place and I am good to go for the getting this vise set up on the first operation of the part. I'm gonna do a little prep work and that's gonna be to expand out the vise and I'm gonna go turn off the stock. I don't need to see that. I will create that inside of the Fusion setup when I create it. The other thing that I can do here is I could turn off the joints if I want to or I could leave the joint on and turn off the individual joint for that particular joint that I just made. Now that I have that set up, I'm gonna to switch to the manufacturing environment where I can get working on creating my setup. So the first thing I wanna do is create my setup. I'm gonna choose a new setup. I wanna start out by telling Fusion the model that I wanna machine. So I'm gonna click on select and click on my model that I wanna machine. The next thing I wanna do is my work coordinate system isn't oriented properly. So I'm gonna get that set. And the way that I like to do this, this is just my personal preference, is to find the base of the Z and click on it, and then the top face of the part. And that gets everything reset. So my X is going the right direction, my Z is going up, and my Y is going away from me. I'm gonna go over to the stock tab, and for my mode, I'm gonna choose a fixed size box. You might wanna make sure that you have the round up to nearest set to zero first. And now I'll just set in the size of the stock. Three by two by one. And then I'm gonna offset this from the top and the offset that I used was 0 0.015. Now I could have also done from solid and then just browse to my models and found that piece of stock and use that as my solid body that I wanted to work from. When I have my setup set up like that, I'm happy with it. I'll choose okay and I'm ready to start throwing some tool paths on this part. Earlier in the video, I did mention that I was going to reorient the view cube, so I think I'll do that now. I'm gonna click on the word front, and I'm just gonna rotate this around like that. Now, when I look at this, this really isn't the front anymore. This would be what I would consider the top. So I'll right click on the view cube, and I'll say set current view as, and then I'm just gonna to choose top. I can rotate around until I get the isometric view of this that I want as well, and then I can right click on the view cube and say set current view as home, fit to view. Now the shadows should be right. I can rotate this part anywhere I want to when I click on the home button. Everything is oriented the right way and the view cube matches the manufacturing environment for front, right, and top. If I switch back to design, you'll see that the view cube isn't changed for this particular orientation. So for groups that are working with designers and programmers and they're working in the same file, you can drive your designers crazy by switching the orientation in the design workspace instead of the manufacturer workspace. I'm gonna jump back into the manufacturer workspace and we can start to add the tool paths on. I'm gonna start out by adding a simple facing tool path. So from the 2D menu, I'm gonna choose face and I'm gonna grab the select. I'll drag this out so you can see all the tab names. On the tool tab, I'm gonna hit select, and I wanna go down to the Fusion 360 Million Tools Inch Library. I'll filter it by face mills, and I'm gonna grab this two inch face mill. Now, I'm not gonna go over changing feeds and speeds. There's just too many variables from tools, the number of flutes to whatever. Uh, so this is mostly gonna focus on tool pathing. For my geometry, I'm not gonna select anything. I want to face everything inside of the yellow box. If I look at the heights tab, it's already set to go from the stock top to the model top. On the passes tab, I might do a small adjustment here. My, my face mill is two inches and my stock is two inches. So I might put just a small offset of 50 thousandths of an inch just to make sure we clean up that entire face and everything on the linking should be fine. I might check extend before retract and I'll choose okay. And now we can see a simple facing toolpath that cleans up the top of the part. Before I move on to my next toolpath, I just wanna look at this from the side so that you can see if I click on the setup, you can see the here's my top of my jaw and there's the bottom of my part. So there's not a lot of extra room to work in there. I won't be able to cut very much past the bottom of my part without running into the vice jaws. Ideally, I'd probably like to use a bullnose tool on this part, but I have to get past the radius of the tool to clean up the entire wall that I wanna do. So I'm just gonna use a flat end mill. And on this side, I guess the bullnose tool isn't all that helpful. I was thinking of the bullnose for the flip side. I'm just gonna use a half inch end mill instead. 
I love adaptive clearing, but adaptive clearing isn't the right tool path all the time. Instead of using adaptive clearing on this part, I'm just gonna use a 2D contour. If we think about it, there's only about 100 thousandths on each side of the part and 60 thousandths on the front and the back. So we really don't have to spend a lot of time roughing that material away. Instead, I'm just gonna do a 2D contour to get rid of that material. From the 2D menu, I'm gonna select 2D contour and I'm gonna go grab a tool again from the milling tools inch library. I'm gonna filter by flat end mills and inside of here is going to be a half inch flat end mill. Now these tools have presets associated with them. So I'm gonna grab, it doesn't really matter if I grab the roughing or the finishing, looks that they're most of the same. There's probably a feed per tooth difference. Yeah, there's a different in feed per tooth between the two. Um, so let me grab this roughing parameter here and I'll select it. And on my geometry, I want to go grab a chain. So I'm gonna choose a chain and I'm gonna grab that chain right there and I'll hit OK to accept it. On the Heights tab, I wanna cut from the model top. And for the bottom height, I wanna cut not to the contour I selected, I wanna cut down to the model bottom. And then I wanna cut a little bit past, so I'm gonna try 15 thousandths of an inch. Now, if I come over and I look, minus 0.01, I just wanna see if I can get that plane. It disappeared there for a second. So you can see at 10 thousandths, I'm above the vice jaw. If I do 15 thou, I'm still above the vice jaw, but it's pretty close. So it's, it's gonna be okay, but I'm gonna be really close to hitting that jaw as I do this. I'm gonna go over to the passes tab, and here's where I wanna make a couple of adjustments. I'm gonna choose that I wanna do roughing passes, and I'm gonna say that maybe I wanna do about 50 thousandths, we'll do 60 thousandths for my first pass. I'm gonna do a 60 thousandths maximum step over, and then I'm gonna do a, a finishing pass of 40 thousandths of an inch, will be fine. I could leave that at whatever and I would finish it up, but those two add up to that 100 thousandths of an inch value that I was talking about earlier not necessary to do that at all though if i needed to if this is a longer cut than your machine can handle with the horsepower i could also enable multiple depths and when we flip this part over on the back side i will be doing a multiple depth contouring operation you'll also notice that i've got a little bit of a finishing overlap so the tool doesn't start and finish exactly where it starts and if i were to edit my expression i've just set this up to be equal to the tool diameter times 25 percent so whatever tool i use is going to go 25 percent of that tool diameter pass. So 25 percent of a half inch is an eighth of an inch. On the linking tab, I'm going to choose that I'd like to specify an entry position. And I'm just going to grab this corner right there. And I'm also going to make a change to the lead in lead out. I'm going to say that I want to lead in at zero degrees and I want to lead out a little differently. I'll uncheck the same as lead in. And for the lead out, I'm gonna set that to be 45 degrees. I should be happy with that. I'm gonna hit okay and see what my tool path looks like. And there I get what I want where the tool leads in from the side, makes two laps around it before it does the, the cleanup pass on the second lap. And that finishes out the tool pass for the first side of this part. So hopefully you guys picked up a few things on the setup or whatever it might be. Come back and watch me program side two of this part. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.